Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. It is my privilege to introduce the Assistant Secretary of Defense of Public Affairs, Dr. George Little. Good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. And thank you, Petty Officer DeRosa. I'm grateful to Ray Shepard, the Defense Media Activity Director, and Colonel Jeremy Martin, Commandant of the Defense Information School, for inviting me to speak today and making this event possible. And I appreciate the time you're all taking to be here. It's great to be back up at Fort Meade and speaking at DMA Studio One. Uh, if you're here for a classified briefing, you're on the wrong part of the base. <laughs> If you're here for the course on the origins of unpopular words, you're in the wrong classroom. Not to spoil today's lesson, but the word of the day is sequestration. Uh, this morning I'd like to uh, share some overarching thoughts about our public affairs community and our mission going forward. And I'd like to begin by thanking all of you in the department's public affairs community for the great work you do to make sure that the American people know that what our military and civilian agencies are doing to keep our nation safe. You are all part of a dynamic, professional public affairs community that I am proud to lead every day. Whether it's working with my team at the Pentagon or visiting PAOs at the combatant commands, I've had the opportunity to see the tremendous impact you all have on the mission of the Department of Defense. A quick shout out to one person who has made a tremendous impact over the course of his career. For the past 21 years, Master Sergeant Jeremy Locke has exemplified hard work, most recently serving as a chief photographer for Ameren Magazine. Master Sergeant Locke, thank you for your service and good luck in your retirement. Give him a hand. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize those in our community who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, whether military or civilian. To all of you who have served in a war zone, who have risked your lives while working with our operations in the field, we thank you for your service. As we draw down our forces in Afghanistan, we are reminded that public affairs professionals still put themselves at risk to tell the incredible story of America's wars and the people who fight them. Today I'd like to pause and remember one of our own, Army Specialist Hilda Clayton. A combat camera soldier assigned to Fort Meade and someone who spent a lot of time here at Denfos, Hilda was killed recently in a training exercise in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. She was part of our community, our public affairs family, and the Fort Meade team. Our hearts go out to her, her family, her friends, and her public affairs colleagues. As public affairs professionals, you are part of a long and distinguished line. The relationship between the press and the military predates the Republic. OSD's historians tell me that George Washington, and by the way, I'm particularly and personally grateful for the resurgence of George as a popular name. Uh, George Washington supplied a newspaper publisher with tenting cloth so that his troops would be able to read a newspaper regularly. Washington also implored Congress to make arrangements for a small traveling press pool to follow his moves at headquarters in order to give speedy and exact information about any military transactions. This request was denied. It never happens in this town. If only the Pentagon Press Association had been established earlier, things might have been different. What's true today, though, is that the Department of Defense is going through a once-in-a-generation change, and our community, the public affairs community, must change with it. Today, maybe more than ever, public affairs is an absolutely critical component of our military and our department. We operate in a world so tightly connected that every world event, big or small, can be felt in real time. Thanks to the internet, and services such as Twitter and Facebook, the walls between citizens, journalists, and the military have never been thinner. 
In many ways, this is positive for our democracy. And as these lines continue to overlap and evolve, your relationship with your commanders and senior civilian leaders is crucial. You are not just, not just typers of talking points, but strategic advisors, helping your leadership manage and navigate a complex media landscape and an equally complex set of issues surrounding national security. In the context of these significant shifts, I'd like to address three key issues. First, we must reflect on how DOD public affairs has transitioned over a decade of war and tremendous shifts in the media environment. Second, we must identify the areas where public affairs can improve officers in our community, can trade our, improve our tradecraft, what skills we need to perfect to better explain what our department does. And third, we must examine the role our military and civilian leaders play in helping our mission in the public affairs community. In the last 12 years, the way we interact with the press has changed dramatically. By embedding reporters directly within military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, PAOs and commanders were able to forge close bonds with the reporters and photographers who were embedded with them. As we reshape the force globally, we must look for new ways to enhance these bonds. And we need to be mindful of the fact that following the drawdown in Afghanistan next year and barring any unforeseen contingencies, we will be moving more toward a garrison public affairs environment. Today, news breaks, not just on television, but on websites and blogs and Twitter. Media outlets have become more and more dynamic, able to report a story in near real time. Reporters are not just filing stories with large newspapers and trade publications, they're also reporting through blogs and Twitter. With the move to dedicated blogs and reporters on Twitter, there's a hunger for more news to file small stories and report tidbits multiple times a day. This type of reporting and this kind of demand signal lifts the curtain on the day-to-day -day operations at the Pentagon or within the services. This can be valuable in humanizing the complex offices we all work in, but it can also present risks, allowing gossip and rumor to take the place of long-form reporting. These changes have consequences for public affairs professionals in the department. First, we can no longer rely on relationships with a handful of journalists. We must constantly be listening for new voices on defense issues and develop those relationships as well. A new blogger might end up being more influential than traditional outlets in some cases. If we aren't talking to him or her, we are mentioning, missing a potential opportunity to inform the American people. The barrier to entry in the news world is so low today that every person with a smartphone has the potential to report news. One reaction to all of these changes might be to be more insular to fear the immediate reaction that is possible in the current news environment. I believe there's a different path we must take. We must engage with anyone and everyone who is interested in what the department is doing. I believe we need more engagement, not less. We should be meeting our stakeholders wherever they are. In order to effectively communicate our message, we must be communicating across all platforms, new and old. By creating richer, more interesting content, we can create a deeper connection with the American public and nourish the growing news appetite on our terms. Public affairs officers have done a stellar job over the past 12 years. But in order to meet new challenges, we need to push ourselves to be better, both in our individual skills and how we work as a community. This is particularly true given the fact that we are entering an era of constrained resources. No longer are budget constraints hypothetical. All civilians, and that includes yours truly, have begun taking weekly furlough days to make up the budget shortfall in fiscal year 2013. While details are still to be clarified for fiscal year 14, we must all think creatively on how best to communicate with the American people. We can learn new outreach techniques by looking at what's happening in the private and nonprofit sectors. And we must be ready to experiment with new and less expensive ways to connect with the nation. No matter what medium we're using, 
but we must be effective communicators. Leave the jargon and acronyms to the planners and operators at other parts of the department. We must communicate with the American public in crisp and memorable lines that deliver a clear and accurate message. I encourage everyone who works in public affairs to truly become a student of writing and media. Those who excel in this profession are hungry for information. They're always reading articles, journals, fiction, and if they're a student of Admiral Kirby, Chief of Naval Information, they may be reading some poetry as well. They're even reading Duffel Blog and watching The Daily Show. The more you can understand the media business, not just the military media business, the better you will be at your jobs and the more successful you will be at communicating your message to the American people. Read the op-ed columns. Read the sports columns. Understand what lines connect with the reader. Understand what headline you need to grab their attention. Intellectual curiosity provides a basis for sound work, but it must be complemented by professionalism in your craft. I've sometimes heard the public affairs professionals feel like their job is to link the press to the experts in the department. I disagree. It's important for us as public affairs professionals to gain a firm grounding in the substance. You must all aim to be experts of your beat, whether it's the aircraft carrier you're stationed on, the FOB where you're deployed, or the issue area you're covering in my press ops office. You must know your issues inside and out. You must know more than the reporter that is asking you questions, and you, you must know, you must know uh, to be able to communicate on equal terms with the commander you serve. You must always be willing to be the spokesperson and to shape the story yourself. Part of the job in public affairs is to provide context. Help the public understand what we are doing, why we are doing it, and how it fits into our larger strategy. I've already talked about how we can reach more Americans, but expanding our reach is meaningless if we are not explaining our issues in a clear way and in terms the public can understand. It's not just us. Commanders and senior civilian leaders also have a role to play as we move forward. Well-read and practiced PAOs must still operate in the larger DOD community, and PAOs need the institutional support of their military service. For years now, we have pushed the services to cultivate first-rate PAOs, and we have many of them. While there's been progress to improve the training of our public affairs officers, I believe the services must do more. In particular, they must see public affairs as a place for their best and brightest. They must provide the tools to turn young PAOs into strategists who understand all facets of public affairs. There needs to be more opportunity for PAOs as they progress in their careers, upward mobility, and incentives for talented officers. We are losing too many talented O5s because they see no path to long-term senior advancement. This is a problem that we will all need to grapple with, and I hope that the services will agree with me. For the services have a proud heritage of excellence in their public affairs offices. The Army Public Affairs Office was founded by none other than Douglas MacArthur, then a major in the United States Army. And not to be outdone, the Air Force Public Affairs Office can count at least one Commander-in-Chief as their own. After a stint in the Cavalry, Ronald Reagan worked in the U.S. Army Air Force's first motion picture unit. Looking to the broader military community, all leaders must understand the role of the press and the importance of working with the media. And we cannot hide our bad news stories. Bad news gets out one way or the other, and we must come to terms with telling the bad stories as well as the good. When bad things happen, the American people should hear it from us, not as a scoop on the Drudge Report. <laughs> Unlike many fine red wines, bad news does not get better with age. This requires commanders to change how they view their relationship with the press in some cases. All commanders need to be open and honest with the press. Great military leaders of the past have echoed this sentiment. At the end of World War I, General Pershing wrote, and I quote, the national defense is the ultimate mission of the Army, and a proper presentation to the public is one of the important duties of the officers of the Army. In World War II, as general of the Army, Eisenhower knew this and ordered his subordinate commanders to be open to the news media. 
insisting that reporters, quote, should be allowed to talk freely with officers and enlisted personnel and to see the machinery of war in operation in order to visualize and transmit the conditions under which the men are waging war. Commanders must work with reporters and understand that their reporting has a real effect on the public's opinion of the military. Public affairs professionals, especially in periods of turbulence like we're facing right now, place a critical role in educating their senior leaders to create and execute a communications strategy. PAOs must be that conduit between commanders and the media. They must likewise be unafraid to speak truth to power. When I'm out talking to troops and public affairs professionals, I always say our PAOs need to be senior advisors first and public affairs officers second. They need to be a trusted member of their commander's inner circle, providing counsel for regular public engagement and engagement during specific moments of crisis. This also goes for PAOs who support civilian leaders in our department. Senior military officials and senior civilian leaders must engage with all outlets in a strategic and balanced approach. To execute this successfully, leaders must rely on their PAO's strategic advice. I've talked a lot today about PAOs being strategic advisors or giving strategic advice, so naturally some of you may be wondering about the role strategic communications plays in our public affairs operation. Up until recently, my office had an office of strategic communications. Despite closing this office, I believe strategic communications as a function is vital to our success. But it should not be a separate vein of public affairs. Strategic communications is a skill that we should all possess. Each commander or civilian leader will have his or her own, her own vision, and it is your job to communicate that vision to the media and the broader public. Strategic communications also means that we are all aware of how our efforts work together with other public affairs professionals in the building and that we are playing a part in the larger outreach strategy of the department, not just responding to the query of the day. Strategic communications, in many respects, is about long-term public affairs planning. In my office, I work closely with my community relations team, who works every day to develop ties in every community the military is located, which is pretty much everywhere. <laughs> in this country and in many places around the world. They are a key component of how I think about public affairs. Their work with veteran service organizations and military service organizations helps us build a stronger message when talking about veterans' issues. We produce the veteran, after all, in this department. No matter what the issue, veterans or the budget, personnel or weapon systems, we must engage the public through all channels. We must be engaged not only with the press, but also with community leaders and stakeholders to deliver our message in as many ways as possible. Our jobs are not easy. Anyone who thinks public affairs is easy <laughs> needs to think twice. I think you all know that. And I would say that our job is going to be more difficult as we enter a new era for our armed forces. As the department grapples with changes in funding and priorities, the public affairs community has a duty to provide the public with clear, accurate, and timely information. We are going to have to be a steady hand at the helm through some rough waters. Rough waters. I'm confident that we can rise to meet this challenge. With the support of military and civilian leadership, I know that we can play a critical role in delivering the department's message to the American people. That, after all, is our mission. I'm asking all of you here today and all of you on your bases around the world to remember that you are the link between the department and the outside world. It's a two-way street. You must clearly articulate how the department and your specific services plan to act, but you must also listen to the American people and you must engage them. You all have been given a unique and special responsibility within the department. And we have a moral obligation to the American people to explain the department's intentions, and to share the nation's thoughts and ideas with those we serve. As I close my remarks, I am reminded of Marine Corps Major Megan McClung, who was killed in December 2006 while escorting press in Al Anbar province. In the final month of her tour in Iraq, Megan's Humvee was destroyed by an IED as she was escorting reporters into downtown Ramadi. Megan was a true professional 
often going out of her way to help those around her. After her death, Megan's mother received email after email from strangers who told her of the ways, both big and small, that Megan had helped them. Her parents knew she was a skilled officer, but they never knew how many lives she touched until after her death. Let Megan's legacy be an example of what we strive for each and every day. Let us remember the power that we have to communicate with the American people and people around the world. As we emerge from more than a decade of war, Secretary Hagel has rightfully called this a defining time for our country. This community has a critical role to play in shaping our military's future. We, as public affairs officers, must explain the role our military plays in the world, and we must be as open and honest as possible in explaining the actions of our troops abroad. While the stakes are high, I am confident that the entire Department of Defense Public Affairs team can meet these challenges head on. Thank you. Thank you again for being here today, and I'd be delighted to take uh, some questions. I believe I'd be delighted to take some advice. <laughs> <laughs> Feedback, <laughs> please. We'll start with the Associated Press. <laughs> Dr. Little, how, how are you doing? Uh, Colonel Johnson over U.S. Cyber Command. And by the way, we are, in fact, working on Tom Shanker's interview. Okay, so, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, we get a lot of feedback over there because I'm on the Title 10 side of U.S. Cyber Command and NSA Title 50. So um, what's your advice for how do we continue to get out in front of this, or is there a plan because we're also the White House is involved, you, you all are involved. So what's the way ahead strategy? We, we're getting a lot of you know input from a lot of folks, but just – from the horse's mouth. Sure. Uh, well, thank you very much, and uh, appreciate all that you do up at the Cybercom. Uh, yes, NSA has been in the news lately. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned Title 10 and Title 50. I've walked down both roads, uh, having sure. been uh, CIA spokesman uh, for a number of years, and uh, now being in the Title 10 uh, world. Uh, I think that uh, my experience at CIA is most instructive, at least in how I'm thinking about uh, the challenges facing the intelligence community and our uh, and NSA and Cybercom in particular. Uh, there are obvious lines that we can't cross in uh, conveying classified information. That goes uh, without saying. But there's a way to talk about the mission uh, and uh, the programs that uh, are created that are deemed lawful uh, by the executive branch and by the Congress uh, and how they uh, support the American people. And I think that without getting into sources and methods, uh, without getting into um, uh, the classified information, there's a way to uh, make clear and concise points uh, about uh, the mission of NSA and of Cybercom. General Alexander, I think, has uh, done a very effective job uh, in recent uh, media interviews. Uh, and I think the more that uh, NSA can uh, talk about uh, what it does and how it contributes to the nation's security, I think that'll be helpful uh, in informing the American people. Uh, and uh, we'll get through this uh, rough patch. Uh, make no mistake about it, uh, recent events are deeply troubling uh, on many levels. Uh, the unauthorized, unauthorized disclosure of classified information is, well, uh, against the law uh, and uh, is wrong. Uh, but there is, uh, I think, going to be light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, but it, uh, it won't be easy, and there'll be some chop uh, along the way. But as long as we're straightforward and accurate uh, with the press, I think that's the way we have to deal with the situation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you bet. it. While we're waiting for the next uh, question to come about, you know, Churchill, I think it was Churchill. Uh, you can fact check me on this, uh, and I'll reclama. When you, in crisis communications, I always reflect on this quote. He used to say, uh, if you're going to go through hell, just keep on going. <laughs> and uh, I think that's uh, the posture that we have to take. In crisis communications uh, in particular, uh, if, if you're the one at the table as a public affairs officer who's all jittery and nervous, uh, that's not good. You've got to be the, uh, the one who's saying, we can manage this, so this is how we do it, and uh, we'll get across uh, this rough patch. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Shavers with DMA Operations. In your earlier comments, you talked about the need to engage with the wide range of media that are out there, and I agree with you there. 
However, over the course of my career, I've oftentimes had to try and figure out what is the most beneficial return on investment, if you will, type of engagement. So I would appreciate your thoughts on when you're dealing with news media, how do you determine what's going to provide the best return in terms of my engagement? Because I can't engage with every single one of them. Right. Well, that's true. I think uh, we all have to prioritize our, our tasks throughout the day, and we all have to prioritize what uh, we're looking at in terms of press stories uh, coming down the pike. You know, in this business, uh, as in others, uh, one of the critical skill sets that separates success from failure is good judgment. <laughs> and good judgment, I think, is how you navigate your way through the day, uh, especially if you're a media relations officer dealing with the New York Times, or the Washington Post, or the LA Times at the same time you're dealing with uh, pick your blog uh, post out there. And what determines it for me is timing of the story, if I know it and also uh, the serious nature of the story uh, that's coming down the pike and the serious nature of the query. If a blogger comes in uh, with something that's uh, potentially problematic uh, and uh, could result in a major media crisis, then I'm gonna tackle that one first uh, because I know that uh, traditional uh, media outlets uh, look to the blogs uh, just as we do. Uh, I can remember um, an uncomfortable moment, uh, and I won't say exactly who, but a few years ago, uh, a uh, blog reported that a very senior official in our government was about to uh, resign for this out of the other reason. Uh, and that quickly went viral, uh, and it just happened to be that I was uh, having lunch that day with this senior official, and I said, uh, this is an uncomfortable way to start a lunch conversation, uh, but uh, do you plan on pulling pitch? <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, uh, it was untrue, but uh, it had gone viral. Uh, so that's just one example of how we have to pay attention uh, to what some people term non-traditional media outlets. Uh, so we can't uh, just uh, think about media in the way we did five, 10 years ago. It's a new media landscape. Hopefully that helps to some extent. Yes, sir. Thank you for the perspective. You bet. One or two more? Hello. How are you? <laughs> it's my first time up here. I'm Staff Sergeant Hostetler. I work for Air Force Production. Great. I, my question is, you mentioned that we need to start telling the story about the bad news as well as the good. And the issue that I see that we're facing, I just got back from Afghanistan and the issues that we faced before, you know, the, the big incident that I can think of before I left was when the Air Force pilots talked about the epoxy that they were experiencing. It seems like we have this culture in our career to kind of glaze over these issues and put out this positive press on, no, our jets are fine. And so with the good and the bad, I don't think the American people actually trust us to deliver the accurate information. How are we, what's the plan to change that in the way ahead? Because to continue the way we have, to continue to put that positive spin, it feels like we're losing a lot of our audience because they're not listening. Because we keep saying the same thing over, everything is okay, and it's not. Like, or with the sexual assault issues that we've been experiencing in the Air Force. So how do we change that culture from that PAO up? Because a lot of times, the speaking from my perspective, and I can only speak from my perspective and a junior enlisted perspective, the younger generations get it, that we have to start being honest and forthright. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to convey those ideas and convince the chain of command to necessarily follow those or to be ready to put that first foot forward before someone else leaks our story. Is there a plan to kind of change the way that we think? Because as it is, a lot of people, from what I can see, are going through with it. We're putting out mindless propaganda, is what some of us feel that we're putting out, and that what the American people feel that we're putting out. So how do we change this? Thank you for a very good question, and thank you for uh, your recent uh, service uh, in Afghanistan. This is, uh, I think, a point of tension uh, that uh, has long been noted uh, in the public affairs community. What is spin uh, versus what is a legitimate defense of your equities, whether it be an aircraft program or some other mission. My perspective on this is that uh, we should not think in terms of spin. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that word and it's something I try to avoid. 
Do I defend the equities of this department? Absolutely. Do I defend our men and women in uniform and our civilians? Absolutely. Uh, do I uh, fight it out on, on tough stories? Yes. But the way to get through problems such as the one you just noted, I think, is to acknowledge when we have a problem. <laughs> it's going to get out. <laughs> so let's be straightforward about it. Let's be accurate and let's show a plan for how we're going to get through the problem. Uh, and uh, you mentioned a very good uh, topic and one that has attracted, appropriately so, a lot of media attention recently, and that's the issue of sexual assault uh, in the military. Uh, Secretary Hagel, I think, has done a very good job of acknowledging the fact that we do have an issue inside this department. And he's termed it a cultural issue. And we need to show that, yes, uh, we have this problem, and here's what we're doing about it. Because that's how you get yourself out of a tough spot. In your personal life, <laughs> you have to acknowledge it first and then take action. And it's the same thing for public affairs professionals. We have one of the highest ratings in terms of uh, institutions in this country, the U.S. military does. Recent public opinion poll, I think, that, and I think I saw some facts coming out of DMA, in fact, that, uh, that supported that. And in order to maintain that legitimacy uh, and our credibility, we have to tell it to the American people uh, as straight as we can. Uh, and if we uh, try to avoid the problem, delay it, if we're uh, not up front, uh, then that's going to have a corrosive effect on us as individual public affairs professionals when we're dealing with an individual reporter, but ultimately us as an institution. And I think that's problematic. So I don't think in terms of spin. I certainly don't think in terms of, of uh, propaganda, especially in the public affairs uh, community. I, I think about our obligation, moral and, and legally, to be accurate uh, and, to, uh, and to tell the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Little. I'm Erin Whitcup, um, a defense contractor. I manage the DOD Live blog and the DOD um, Defense Department Facebook page. And my question for you is, uh, have you given any thought to what you would like the Defense Department's social media presence to be? As you mentioned, bloggers are now becoming much more important in terms of um, their credibility within news, and how do we want to engage with that facet? And also, as you said, um, kind of going off Staff Sergeant Hostetler's um, question, when something bad does happen, how quickly do you want um, the Defense Department's social media operations to engage with that and get the word out there? We traditionally usually wait um, for you know official messaging from the Defense Secretary, mm -hmm. but social media is a fast-paced realm. People. People want to know answers, or they do want an acknowledgement much quicker, right, sure. or they tend to kind of get the idea that, not necessarily that there's a conspiracy, but they get angry, and then they do tend to perceive our messaging as spin. So have you given any thought to how um, Defense Department Public Affairs should engage with social media and its pace? Yes, I think, uh, A, I think we should em embrace uh, social media, uh, and B, even if I didn't think that, uh, we have no choice. <laughs> Uh, it's the media landscape uh, of the 21st century. Uh, so we have to figure out how we're going to communicate uh, through the social media channels. And not just the bad news, uh, but also uh, the good news of what we're doing. Uh, I think there are, are lots of good news stories that could be told through social media that uh, we don't tell through other channels. So uh, it, now to your question about bad news and social media, yes, we have a responsibility to communicate uh, to uh, our own uh, people, the three million plus uh, uniformed and civilian members of the Department of Defense, uh, and also to the American people. Now, uh, when it comes to bad news, sometimes we have to do this in a structured way, I think for good reason. Uh, we have to notify Congress. We have an obligation to our oversight committees. Uh, they don't like to be surprised uh, by bad news. So we have to go through the proper channels, I think. But ultimately, we have to be timely in how we communicate bad news, and I think that's the point I'm trying to get at. And social media, I think, is one vehicle to accomplish that goal. Thank you. Morning, sir. Morning. Uh, sec Second Lieutenant Justin Phillips uh, from Jacksonville, Florida, uh, 120 the Fire Wing. Uh, I'm the newly appointed PAO there. Great. How would you we recommend? We had a good time with the secretary down in Jacksonville, sir. We just had a good time with the secretary. In Jacksonville. Oh yes, sir. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, sir. You bet. Uh, how would you recommend going Jaguar back? Fan? Sir. Jaguar fan. Uh, somewhat more of a University of Florida fan. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Go Gators. No. <laughs> uh, <so. laughs> um, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Good with that, sir. 
Um, my wife grew up in Miami, so I went to UVA. Uh, so okay. uh, I'm a Virginia football fan. It's been a rough patch for us, but uh, yes, sir. Uh, anyway, go go ahead with your question. <laughs> this is what this is I what I try to do. I commend you for admitting that, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sir, as, as a young inspired lieutenant going back to a command, I'm prior enlisted, uh, newly appointed to the PAO position. Uh, it's so easy to be amongst fellow PA uh, representatives and get so inspired at how important it is to the success of our mission. How would you recommend going back to a command and re-emphasizing and, uh, for better words, uh, convincing our leaders that it, it is so important to mission success? Uh, going back to a fighter wing where, you know, flying those birds is the most important thing on their mind. Uh, how would you uh, recommend approaching that? That's a good uh, question. I think it's about uh, having conversations at uh, uh, whatever opportunity you can, uh, whether it's in the chow hall or in the commissary or as you're walking down the street uh, on, the, on the way to your car. That's how we're going to get this message uh, across. There are some in, in government and in the private sector for that matter who view uh, PA as a quintessential support function. Uh, and you bring in the PAOs uh, when all else fails. Uh, that's uh, problematic, uh, and I think uh, that's the point I was trying to uh, get across today was that public affairs is mission central. It's mission critical. And it's better, if there's a problem especially, to be involved in the conversations and to have awareness uh, early on. And then to get out ahead of it uh, so that we're not just the uh, public affairs uh, ordinance disposal unit <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, that's not our job. Our job is to help coach our military and civilian leaders uh, through some tough times when it's a tough story. So I think it's about engaging. Uh, I think some inside the department and elsewhere think that public affairs officers or a branch office of pick your newspaper <laughs> or wire service. That's not correct. Uh, we know our role. We know our job. Uh, it's to uh, represent uh, the men and women of this department. And I think if you can come up with some tangible examples uh, of where bringing in public affairs early helps and is a strategic player uh, at the table. Uh, and some examples where public affairs was brought in later uh, and it didn't work out so well, uh, then I think that can help draw some compare and contrast scenarios that might resonate uh, with uh, senior leaders. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. One more question. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm morning. Sergeant Piper. I work over in Army Production. Great. Here. And where are you from? Uh, Ohio originally, <laughs> okay, but uh, all right. it's been a while since I've been there. Okay. All right. Uh, my, He's my trying to get past the sports questions, I think. <laughs> 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 and you root for? Pick your team? Don't really have one, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. That's, that's a safe answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question, sir, uh, it revolves around our, our communication to the internal audience. Yes. And I was just kind of curious to find out what direction do you think we should go as, you know, we interact with base newspapers, through yeah. blogs, you know, the myriad of ways that we're approaching our internal audience. Uh, what do you see for the future? There will always be a central role for internal communications uh, to play inside the Department of Defense. Uh, your base newsletter or a newspaper uh, and uh, all the um, broadcast means by which we deliver messages to our, our troops and civilians overseas especially is critical, critical. Uh, so uh, there's no doubt that we have to view internal communications as mission central and mission critical as well. Uh, I would note that in today's day and age, uh, I don't see a whole lot of difference frankly between external and internal communication. So we have to be mindful of that fact uh, because what we say uh, generally gets out, and that's, that's okay, uh, that's fine. But we need to be aware of the fact that what we say, quote unquote, internally, could have external impact. So that's, that's one thing that I would just uh, leave you with. But uh, bottom line is uh, we have to communicate internally. As I told the Secretary of Defense recently, one out of every 100 Americans works for you. <laughs> that's a large number, three million people. Uh, I joked with him that that's twice the size of the state of Nebraska <laughs> or thereabouts, uh, where he's from. It's a big job uh, and there are so many audiences and uh, stakeholders to engage internally that we have to do that in the right way. And uh, I think on our internal uh, communications, uh, I probably need to do a better job of uh, providing guidance on how we address different audiences. I think the services uh, in many respects do this uh, pretty well, uh, but I think it's worth looking at. That's a good question, and thank you. Thank you, sir. All right.
and go team, whatever that may be for you. All right, <laughs> all right well, thank you all very much uh, for being here. It's been a delight for me. Uh, great questions, uh, as I would expect uh, from uh, a public affairs uh, audience. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll uh, wish you a good day, and uh, thanks for all your hard work. Appreciate it. Take care. Please rise.